It's a uh, very great pleasure to uh, welcome you all uh, on behalf of the director uh, to this lecture by Professor Nicholas Luhmann. The lecture forms uh, part of a series um, marking the centenary of the school, and we're really honored uh, to be able to associate Professor Luhmann's first visit to the school uh, with that occasion. Uh, you have visited us once. We hope you will come again often. Um, our lecturer is too well known to require any elaborate introduction. Uh, he has taught at the University of Bielefeld uh, since its foundation, and his writings there have given him a uh, preeminent place uh, among contemporary social theorists. All of us, I think, must be intrigued uh, by the title uh, that Professor Luhmann has chosen for his lecture this morning, uh, Systems Theory uh, and Postmodernism. As confidence faltered uh, in the capacity of Marx, Durkheim, and Weber's work uh, to yield an exhaustive understanding of the social world, uh, a number of routes forward uh, began to emerge. One of these involved a rigorous, uh, even austere reinvocation of systems theory. Uh, and that is the route which we predominantly associate with Professor Luhmann. Another route is represented by some unconstrained, uh, eclectic projects of deconstruction uh, grouped under the label of postmodernism. On the face of it, uh, there's some distance uh, between these two uh, programs, uh, even, even a sense that any attempt at admixture uh, would generate uh, turbulence. But the, the, the title of Professor Luhmann's lecture is perhaps suggestive of some link. I invite him now to relieve that suspense. Thank you, Professor Luhmann. Well, thank you very much for your kind introduction and to the school, thank you for the invitation. I was not sure what kind of topic I should choose for, the, uh, for this lecture, and uh, the idea was to take a fashionable title, postmodernism. But uh, with fashion, there we have our problems. We are not sure whether we are in the beginning or in the on the peak of the fashion, or already on its decline. And uh, I think the discussion of po about postmodernity has already uh, some length of, of, so that you can see what is meant and what is defined as postmodernism. And my impression is uh, that uh, it is already declining a little bit, or repeating, feeding upon itself, uh, and ignoring some th similar intellectual endeavors outside of this topic, postmodernism. And uh, so the, the title of my lecture is, uh, uh, should draw attention to the capacities uh, of well, science, well, maybe formalism, maybe poetry, uh, to, to do similar things which are not visible in the narrow discussion on postmodern society. But I have to begin with a few personal remarks, <coughs> because originally I had no interest at all in this literature on postmodernity, uh, and uh, there were several reasons not to, to use too much time to to read all this uh, all this literature. The first was that my impression was that it is a purely semantical discussion, without any reference to the structural and operational realities of modern society. It was just intellectual talk and trying to make sense out of a mixture of distance to, to realities and uh, intellectual uh, re-descriptions of, of previous descriptions. And this was uh, not very much to my taste. 
then, of course, uh, there were other uh, things. Uh, for example, a meeting with Lyotard, who, who said quite bluntly that La Condition Postmoderne is not one of his best books. <laughs> <laughs> and he was not sure whether the, the title Postmodernity in the end of the 70s, taken out of architecture, was appropriate for philosophy or for all kinds of intellectual movements of our days. <coughs> uh, then I uh, tried to see whether we could uh, subsume certain uh, developments in different fields, uh, say the economy or, or law or politics or schools and so uh, under postmodern, on, under distinction modern postmodern and have uh, a kind of, of temporal uh, synchronicity in the sense that the change from modern to postmodern is about in the 20s or in the 40s or in the 70s uh, in all fields. But this is, of course, clearly not possible. On the contrary, uh, I found that uh, the modern developments in all these function systems are uh, more or less uh, continuous, or if there are discontinuities, uh, then they are not uh, within one time period, uh, and they are very different in different systems. So you may ask whether the, the typically uh, monetary economy has a new phase with this kind of, of uh, derivative trades, uh, and whether this is postmodern that people for some time thought that they could do without industry, living just from manipulating the money of others. Uh, whether this is postmodern uh, or not, uh, this was, of course, the late 70s or the 80s. But then if you look at schools, what is postmodern in the development of schools? Everybody has to go to school, and this is since the, at least since the 19th century. So, and... Uh, we try to mobilize uh, uh, capacities uh, via schools, but when does a postmodern area begin in schools? It's difficult to say. Perhaps if you, if you have too many reforms, and a reform need, of course, a kind of lack of memory, a kind of forgetfulness, why previous reforms did not succeed. You have to forget this and begin a new reform, but then this is also in Germany, uh, in the 60s or so, the case. And, <coughs> and you could uh, see in the political field what is postmodernism. This is political rhetoric as a substance of political uh, talk, political communication. Uh, the distrust in the, in, the, uh, in the liberal constitutional state and the scheme which, we, uh, which makes it possible to distinguish parties. Is this postmodern? So uh, my impression was, uh, on the whole, that uh, there is a continuity in, in <coughs> well, mostly functional differentiation and the high degree of, of dynamics and autonomy of function systems. And this means also that function systems uh, overuse their freedom or their autonomy and create problems for themselves and for other systems. But this is just uh, what we could expect uh, from a theory of modern society. And it doesn't, that doesn't make any sense for me to make a period postmodern, uh, after modern society. <coughs> then I looked uh, at uh, the, some of the literature on postmodernity, and I found not very uh, revealing uh, insights. One is, of course, there is no uh, unitary symbolism, no, uh, no meta uh, meta-narration, I think. I don't know how they do it in English. Uh, <laughs> but uh, at least there's no uh, symbol, universally accepted, consensual symbol of the unity of a system anymore. But there are several descriptions. Uh, That's, of course, the point of Lyotard. And I found this interesting, but then the question is, of course, and I go to into this uh, in a few minutes, uh, how could this happen and what does it mean? 
Then there is uh, the idea of no binding tradition. The tradition is no longer binding. But then you find this already uh, very early, partly in the, in the 17th century, for example, in the legal theories of the 17th century. Uh, in, in the common law area, the, the idea was that you could not uh, um, found the validity of common law on the, on the legality of the uh, Norman uh, uh, immigration into Britain. So whether this was, uh, it was at that time, of course, 11th century, discussed whether uh, there was a right to, to take the, the British uh, crown and, or not. But this could not be the, the basis for understanding the common law because it's the wisdom of generations of decision making and so on, refining the instruments, which really is the, uh, the rationality of common law. And we had in, in Germany also the discussion whether the, the introduction of civil law into Germany was an, an, an statute of the empire, uh, of the emperor, uh, Lothar, or not. And, and the, uh, the first uh, history of German law in the 17th century made the point that this is just a development. And interestingly enough, the last chapter of the, uh, the, uh, this kind of uh, investigation was a chapter on reform. So uh, there is a, a kind of historicity uh, and, a, and uh, a correlate to this uh, in the idea of reform as a permanent task to reform uh, the law. And is this postmodern or not? but it is 17th century. So uh, the only case where I could find any clear meaning is architecture. Uh, we had uh, the, the modern style, the highly reductive, simplifying, and so modern style. And, and then in the 17th, the idea that a building should be open to the environment. I mean, it should have contact to other buildings and to streets and to space around it, uh, and not just being a reductive monument of simplification and, and form. And it should also uh, appeal to different tastes of, of perspective, different, different types of education of people, different types of expectations of what a good form is, <coughs> a mixture of style, possibly. And so there is a clear break in the 70s. And as far as I know, Lyotard did take the term postmodernity from architecture. Uh, but then if you look at, uh, at uh, poetry or at the novel and so, you find no clear distinction between the modern and the postmodern area. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about this, whether we make a distinction between modernism and late modernism and postmodernism and what, how the authors fit into this scheme. But this is already very unclear. So uh, on the whole, I, I didn't see any sense uh, into uh, working with this kind of theory of postmodern society or postmodern intellectuality, philosophy, or whatever, until I became aware that my own work was associated with postmodernism. <laughs> <laughs> and this came as a kind of surprise. We had in, the, in September a, a meeting in, in, in the Indiana University in Bloomington uh, postmodernism and system theory, just to make uh, clear or discuss why I am stubbornly refused to s describe the modern uh, society as a postmodern society and using a postmodern theory to do this. Uh, and so I uh, take the topic for this lecture out of this kind of surprise and this kind of reflection. What is what is going on? Why? Uh, my own ideas and the literature to which I normally refer. It's more formalistic than poetry. Uh, but uh, why is this, has this to do with postmodernity? And if so, uh, why the, the frame of discussion of postmodernity is so narrow and did ignore uh, developments, say, in cybernetics, in systems theory, in communication theory, uh, in uh, second order observation points and so. And uh, what I want now to do is to, to uh, 
take the, the cue in the, in the idea that postmodernity has to renounce uh, the, the symbolization of the unity of a system, and in my case, the society. Uh, and, uh, but then, uh, this is not simply a uh, present reality, but this has a history. And I would like to, to draw your attention in, in one part of this lecture to the development of uh, the uh, symbolization of unity in modern society. And I insist on modern society. Uh, I think the uh, development begins in the 17th century when uh, the uh, old hierarchical structure uh, lost his, its plausibility as nature, as the nature of the organism of society. There should be a ruling group and, uh, and uh, there should be nobility and, and commonness, there should be uh, religion and so on and so forth as a condition of the unity, of the natural unity of society. When this uh, was no longer plausible, partly uh, the, the split uh, in the religious uh, confessions, partly the, uh, the crisis of the aristocracy in the 16th, 17th centuries, monetary problems and so on and so forth, the, the idea that aristocracy, especially in France, is a state institution, an institution of positive law, and nothing else, not something natural. Then, of course, uh, the, the idea that the society is, by nature, hierarchical, uh, did uh, no longer convince anybody, and they had to invent substitutes. I think the first substitute was happiness, in the sense that everybody can be happy uh, in a society, whatever his condition, as long as he is satisfied with his condition. So happiness uh, for everybody was a kind of natural argument which cross-cuts the hierarchy, it, and it was even uh, referring to a long theological tradition, uh, clear that uh, high-class people are not necessarily happy, perhaps even more uh, unhappy than other people. Uh, because their aspirations are very high and their, their uh, life is without, uh, full of uh, boring and full of ennui in, in France. And so uh, the first idea was happiness, happiness as a natural possibility of human beings as long as they are, uh, accept certain conditions of life as invariants and as a, their own position in society. This is Alexander Pope would be an English uh, author for this uh, kind of thing, Moliere in France. Uh, and uh, this lasted until the middle of the, the uh, 18th century, and then uh, things began to shift, and I'm not quite clear why. Uh, partly, perhaps, the, the, uh, the increasing impact of a new property conception, uh, partly uh, the enclosure movement and partly the uh, increasing legal machinery, new statutes and so, uh, and uh, at least in the since the French Revolution, the idea that uh, the, uh, the society, the modern society, is not simply a sum total of all the individual happinesses or unhappinesses. So the mental frame of the individual, the individual became more uh, a more important point in the argument but just because this was so, you could not uh, have a uni uniform idea about individuals anymore. Individuals are individuals, they are different. And so you, we needed an, another type of uh, theory of society. Uh, and I think uh, on the whole, solidarity was the, the next slogan. Uh, uh, and it shifts from, from nature to morality, to a normative framework. First, of course, in the, in the workers' uh, movements, uh, but uh, at least uh, at the end of the uh, 19th century with the sociology, solidarity, especially in France, was a term for the, for the society. A society without solidarity would not be a society. And there should be integration. There should be a minimum of consensus. Uh, and of course, Durkheim's De la Division du Travail Social is one of the, the monographs which makes this point. 
But then this did again uh, vanish uh, somehow and was replaced by the idea that the political system should care for, the, uh, for a similarity, not uh, equality complete, but a similarity of living conditions for everybody. So the developing countries, the, the problem of the poor, the problem of the excluded uh, population, uh, the Copenhagen meeting now is just another uh, example of this kind of concern with people who, who suffer, who have uh, uh, no chance in life, no perspectives, no future, uh, and uh, are the victims of a capitalistic or modern development. So the, the active society in the sense of Etzioni was the, uh, <coughs> the next idea. Uh, and dominating much of the uh, social policy and the developing policy of, of uh, our century. Uh, but then, even in Manhattan, one didn't succeed in uh, making equal living conditions. Uh, you have to move from the, from the Fifth Avenue to the ABC D avenues to see the difference. Uh, and if this is not possible in Manhattan, how could we expect that it is possible in a kind of world, global framework. So again, this, uh, this idea is uh, on a normative level, on a level of preferences and values, uh, undisputed, but uh, the realization is increasingly uh, problematic. And if you see the comments on the Copenhagen meeting, you find always it's beautiful, wonderful ideas, but how to do it? and how to proceed practically uh, in this kind of uh, equalization of, or similarization of living conditions. So at the end of this century, we have to, I think we have to accept a society which <coughs> is without happiness, without solidarity, and without equality of living conditions. Uh, and then they invented uh, traditional terms, uh, civil society a kind of seminar-type discussion, a critical discussion about problems uh, as a, the last, last possibility to, to maintain the unity by being critical, just by having a distance uh, or making a difference between aspirations and reasonable solutions and the realities they found. So the civil society or the co communitarian uh, movement is already somehow uh, a, uh, the question whether we could, could uh, use a unity symbol uh, as a symbol which, uh, which neutralizes differences within the society and the difference as such becomes the symbol. We cannot affirm the society, we cannot accept the society as it is. Uh, and uh, the difference is the unity. But this is only one, uh, one way to see the things. It refers to, of course, to stratification. Uh, the difference uh, with which people have in mind in this kind of happiness, solidarity, uh, active society uh, uh, talk is the stratification, class society and so but there are other forms of differentiation, and we have similar developments in, uh, in if you look at the society as functionally differentiated system, uh, we have also a, a kind of development uh, in the sense of an increasing utopian or, or normative framework and an increasing difficulty to place hope into the, uh, the solutions of uh, the unity problem or the solutions or the, the replacement of, of uh, the bad consequences of differentiation with something <coughs> more or less utopian. The thing started in the, at the end of the 19th century with the idea of division of labor. So uh, you could see uh, functional differentiation as division of labor. And this meant at that time that uh, there's a kind of surplus value and uh, kind of classical or neoclassical economic uh, scheme in the sense that if we accept differentiation, functional differentiation, if politicians make politics and the economy makes, makes profits or uh, 
and the, the law makes uh, good uh, legal decisions and so on. Everybody does his own job, and then the 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 results would be would be better in in a kind of vague sense. If in the economy, of course, that's that's uh, um, profitable uh, use of capital and uh, labor. Uh, but in the society, what would be the better situation as a consequence of division of labor? Uh, Durkheim was not very clear about this. He simply found the lack of a solidarity as the problem, and if we have, if we could compensate for div division of labor by a new type of organic solidarity, then the problem would be solved. Uh, but then, in the during this <coughs> during this century, the um, the uh, emphasis shifted from division of labor to a modernization theory, which. Uh, looked at different function systems as such. So in the political system, we should care for democrat democratic solutions, uh, maximize consensus and minimize force uh, in the hands of politicians. And in the economy, there should be a market society. Uh, uh, there should be a credit available for finding the best uh, best point in time for consumption or for production. Uh, in the school education system, of course, we have to have schools which use uh, the capacity of individuals uh, for learning and for developing their own natural uh, capabilities. In the legal system, we should have rule of law or Rechtsstaat in the, in the German sense, which controls even the political system. Science, of course, should be uh, organized around methods and theories and not around uh, ideological assumptions or religious, uh, religious topics. Mass media are the same. So the idea was that if, if only we would uh, modernize all these function systems in a certain <coughs> Western type of orientation, uh, then this would be, uh, the result would be uh, uh, a better society uh, in the sense that the function systems support each other. If we have uh, good schools, we have uh, good labor. Uh, if we have good labor, we have uh, a high productivity. Then we can use uh, surplus money to compensate for, for social problems. Uh, and uh, if we have uh, free press and free scientific research, we would be nearer to discovering the truth and having uh, exact information about the situation of our society and so on and so forth. The, uh, the idea was, uh, and this was not very much elaborate, but simply assumed that uh, the dynamics of function system, uh, which were visible also as a, if you compare modern society with traditional societies, uh, if these uh, dynamics were just uh, set free, then the system would grow, growth as the central phantom of modern society, uh, and then everything would be better than before. Independently of whether we have a regional idea about convergent trends or whether we accept that regions have different routes towards uh, a modern society. But this ignores some troublesome facts that the uh, function systems, if they are operate on their own, as operationally closed function systems, they can create problems which cannot be solved in other systems. So one of the examples, of course, science, the, the atomic energy, uh, atomic bomb uh, problems as a political problem. Uh, and uh, the scientists, of course, say, well, we can do this, and we can show this. And if it is possible, it's hardly to resist. Uh, uh, the use, uh, either in economic terms or in, in uh, political terms. Uh, but then how can the, the political system regulate the use of atomic energy or uh, the atomic uh, possibility, <coughs> possibility of atomic warfare? And increasingly now, I think that the science uh, we have a very developed uh, science and ecological problems, 
but uh, they create not only knowledge but also ignorance and more ignorance than knowledge, uh, especially if you want to have an idea about the consequences of changes. Uh, you can, of course, make a state about the, the uh, chemical situation in the stratosphere as it is. But if you change one factor, what would happen? And the political and the legal system are, of course, uh, uh, have the necessity to change one factor or another one and should know about the consequences. And increasingly, science uh, says, well, we cannot, we cannot know it. It's, it's too complex for uh, scientific for prognosis. And then we have this political expertise uh, and the distrust in technology and science at, on the societal level. And I could uh, continue to, to make examples like this. In Germany, for example, in the legal system, we have a constitutional court which tries to, to develop the law uh, as a potential of control of the welfare state. But the welfare state operates with goals, with, with kind of objectives, uh, and it is in the traditional legal uh, uh, dogmatics very difficult to handle goals. Uh, and uh, so we have a shift from in the, in the interpretation of human rights or civil rights from subjective uh, rights to values. And if you have only values, then, of course, the, the conflict between values is in every decision evident, and it becomes difficult to, uh, to see how the judge will decide a conflict of values, uh, whereas the subjective framework of subjective rights was, of course, uh, uh, better able to, to, to direct the, uh, the adjudication of the, of the constitutional court. So there's again a conflict between uh, the political system uh, and if the court tries to, to maintain the level of legal control of political decision making, it becomes very difficult to do this with, the, with reliable uh, legal instruments. So uh, again the question uh, whether uh, systems uh, in their own dynamics overburden other systems uh, and whether there is a constant conflict or a constant uh, shift in the uh, relations or interfaces between different function systems, which makes it then difficult to see uh, this, the society as a rule for relations between function systems. So again, we have uh, the situation that the, uh, the idea of unity is... Uh, fading away, and uh, the unity in the sense of an essential structure, internal structure of the society, be it rank, be it division of labor. Uh, and now we have uh, exactly this situation to which postmodernism reacts in a, uh, in a certain way to say, well, there is no unifying symbol, no meta receipt anymore. But uh, I think for a sociologist, it would be more helpful to ask the question whether it is uh, the right way to observe society uh, as a unity uh, contrasted with internal differences, a unity in spite of stratification, in spite of functional differentiation, some kind of sameness or identity, some kind of uh, consensus, some kind of integration should be necessary in spite of differences, or whether we uh, should see the society as a difference. And this is uh, where we come into different uh, and difficult uh, theoretical uh, waters, because uh, how could we say that the society is a difference? Uh, and if you want to maintain that it is a unity, then you have to mark the other side. Unity distinct from what? How could the society organize or develop or have a kind of evolution as maintaining a difference uh, in terms of what? What is then the, the proper way of operation? And what then is, uh, what is excluded 
uh, by boundaries from the society. And at this point, I think we can make certain kinds of, of propositions, certain kinds of uh, ideas coming from, from modern development of uh, system theory. And at the final uh, part of my lecture, I would like to see, uh, make this point and show some kind of possibilities of research, of developing of theory uh, on the basis of the idea uh, the, uh, we need a distinction, system and environment, uh, and we need uh, a kind of apparatus, theoretical apparatus, to explain why this distinction or this difference as a product of operation of a system can be maintained, or why it's even probable and almost without, uh, without uh, aspects of catastrophe or ending uh, of life uh, in the organic field or of uh, communication in the social field, whether it's possible to and what are the problems in maintaining uh, uh, and reinforcing and reproducing uh, the, the difference a system makes. Now this comes very close to, to a, a development in system theory which uh, on various levels uh, focuses on the distinction between system and environment. The system is not simply a whole or some kind of, of form or gestalt which exists as such and is to be characterized by the internal differentiation, but the whole and the part. Uh, but increasingly, we see that, uh, that the system maintains itself by, main by boundary maintaining, by maintaining a difference and, and replacing the, uh, the, uh, the problem of uh, maintaining the difference uh, uh, or reintroducing the problem of maintaining the difference into the system. Now, I could, of course, give a long report about uh, the developing of this idea within system theory from, from the uh, theory of, of life as an exchange with the environment to uh, theories of organization with input-output relations uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, I just uh, have no time to do this here, but I wanted to point at a uh, at few actual uh, discussions about these problems and the consequences they have. One is that <coughs> increasingly uh, one insists on a kind of operational closure of systems. Uh, so life can be reproduced only by life or there's a network of, of, of within a cell or within an organism, a network of products of the same system which makes it possible and probable that the system will continue to produce its own product or to reproduce its product out of its product. The term reproduction originally meant uh, production out of products. And uh, so this is the famous autopoiesis discussion in, in biology and in increasingly also in social science. Could we imagine a system in spite of all kinds of causal interferences between system and environment, could we maintain that it is operationally closed in the sense that the, the autopoietic organization or the reproduction of essentials of the system uh, or the reproduction of the possibility of reproduction is guaranteed by the system as such. And there's a kind of evolutionary selection that uh, autopoietic systems are tested in evolution whether they can do it or not. In spite of uh, uh, the kind of causality which we have of course always uh, to assume, uh, brain is operationally closed, uses its own language and so on and so forth, but of course if you cut the, the head off then the brain will stop. Uh, and so there are clear causal relations with the body, uh, but in spite of this we have operational closure. And I tend to, to apply this kind of idea of operational closure to the society, uh, saying that <coughs> society is close on the level of communication. Communication, not action, communication, is the, the type of operation which produces 
uh, a society and reproduces it out of its own product by a kind of recursive reference to previous communication and a, an anticipation of possibilities to continue communication. Not necessarily consensual, of course not reasonable, uh, but uh, in a way producing always the, the possibility to say yes and no and to make a decision, I accept or I do not accept what is proposed, and then the, it goes on and everybody has a chance to make its own statements and continue uh, the communication, reproducing always the difference between yes and no, uh, or rejection and exception of, of propositions. Uh, and if you have this, uh, this idea of operational closure, uh, which, is, uh, which cuts across the, the old distinction between open and closed systems. The, the old distinction meant simply causal isolation. Uh, closed systems are causally isolated and therefore decaying in, the, in, the tendency, in its tendency to, to entropy. Uh, but open systems can manage this problem. This old distinction is just uh, no longer actual, and operational closure means not causal uh, isolation. I have to make this point uh, and repeat to make it clear because uh, there's all much confusion about this idea. If we call uh, the economic system, uh, for example, as an operationally closed system uh, <coughs> on the level of payments, communication via money is the, the autopoietic mechanism which maintains the economy separate from from law, from politics, from science, and so if you have this, then of course you get the objection, wow, we cannot have, we don't pay for nothing. I mean, we, we have our wishes, our needs, and our references to environment, uh, and we are causally dependent on, on uh, technique, technical technology, technology, and so on and so forth, and it is simply nonsense to say this is a closed system, but it, it is a closed system in the sense of operational closure. But then we need a second, uh, <coughs> and this is, the, uh, I think, the more important development in recent uh, second order cybernetics, but also in the mathematical uh, calculus of, of uh, George Spencer Brown in England, that uh, you need to compensate for closure by reintroducing, reintroducing the or copying the distinction of system environment into the system. Uh, in in the, the calculus of laws of form of George Spencer Brown, this is called a re-entry of a form into the form. Uh, that means of a distinction into what is distinguished. And uh, this is, of course, completely clear in system theory. Uh, the system does not only produce a difference, but uh, it makes itself, by its own operation, a distinction between system and environment. It copies the, what it produces as a difference, as a distinction into the system. So that the system uh, distinguishes between self-reference and external references. Communication would work only if you m make a distinction between words and things. If you could not make this distinction, you would simply uh, not be able to communicate anymore. If you uh, continually uh, make confusion between the word apple and real apples and try to eat the word, uh, this would not uh, uh, not go very long. It would not be autopoetically possible. So in a sense, uh, the, the distinction between self-reference and, uh, and external references is a, a necessity uh, that means that the system cannot reach the environment with its own operation. It cannot uh, get out of the system with its own operation. This would simply be an enlargement of boundaries. But it can compensate for this impossibility by uh, using an internal distinction, mind and, and reality or whatever. In Husserl, this is in the phenomenology transcendental phenomenology of Husserl, it's very clear the, the distinction between noises, uh, the consciousness of being conscious, and the phenomena 
the reference to phenomena, which are not outside facts, but simply a, a correlate to consciousness. We cannot have consciousness only by thinking, I'm conscious, I'm conscious, I'm conscious. About what? Uh, is then the next question. So the idea of, of, uh, of compensating for closure by a kind of re-entry mechanism uh, is uh, not quite new, but the, the consequences are uh, more or less uh, intriguing and, and more or less uh, difficult to, to accept. Uh, the consequence is that the system becomes uh, intransparent or in undeterminable for itself. In Spencer Brown's uh, uh, treatise, there is a kind of uh, remark that uh, if you have a re-entry of a distinction into itself, uh, you have an irresolvable undeterminacy. And the interesting point is that this, this kind of intransparency, the system for itself, is not uh, because the environment is too complex. It is not the scheme of dependent and independent variables. It's not the problem of parameters. It is a self-created uncertainty, self-created intransparency, self-created uh, problem which you can solve only within the system. And the, the way out of this uh, kind of uh, self-created uncertainty is to use time. Uh, to use time in a quite new sense uh, of, uh, well, this becomes complicated, uh, of uh, making a difference between, or distinction between future and past, past and future, uh, and, uh, and locating all kinds of operations at the moment where they take place uh, in a present which lives from a difference between past and future. You need, on one side, the memory function. Somehow, uh, memory should be present and not, not as a kind of occasional use of past experience for present purposes, not a kind of memory, well, yesterday I was, I bought this, and yesterday, where did I forget it? Uh, uh, and what did I do yesterday? And uh, how did I come from the airport to the city? And how can I come back? I have to remember the way. This is quite occasional, but uh, the, this new type of memory function is a function which, act, which is part of every operation. If something is familiar to us, that's something that I know that I can drink water, uh, I don't remember uh, the occasion when I learned to drink water. It's just a kind of familiarity uh, uh, which uh, limits the frame for the future. So memory function on one side and the, the oscillation function on the other side. Oscillation in the sense that you have always to make distinctions and you can cross the boundaries. If we have the distinction of, of say, good and bad <coughs> behavior, we could, uh, of course, uh, if we uh, want to be virtuous, we can, of course, uh, not avoid the possibility to be non-virtuous, to, to addict to vices. And, and so this scheme, virtue vice, is an oscillatory scheme. You cannot have one side only. You have always bo both sides, and you have the possibility of crossing. And this possibility of crossing all kinds of distinctions uh, is uh, the indicator that it is future. Now, uh, Well, I, I could go into uh, comparing this kind of temporal idea, distinction of past and, and uh, future, by uh, memory on one side and by uh, oscillation on the other side, uh, and then uh, comparing this with our traditional uh, concept of time as a, as a measure of a process, as a kind of chronology, a kind of a number system, uh, and we have Wednesday or Friday, and we are at this date, and and so the the continuity is 
of time is guaranteed by the, by the distinction between mobile and immobile uh, uh, states, by a kind of flux, a kind of stream of time, uh, which presupposes then that not everybody, everything is, is on the same uh, level of movement. This is our traditional European uh, idea of time, and I think we, uh, we are approaching with the system theory a completely different, different uh, uh, idea of time based on the question, who makes the distinction? When do we make a distinction between past and, and future? And what is the guarantee that we do make tomorrow the same distinction between past and future if we have a different memory and if we prefer different distinctions for oscillation between one side or the other side? So the, uh, the uh, idea of time becomes uh, relative to the idea of the observer. Uh, who observes time and uh, that it is time uh, is seen by the distinction of before and thereafter, or past and future, and memory and oscillation. Uh, but uh, uh, how this distinction, what is available as memory, and what kind of distinction I use for oscillation? It is too false, or bad good, or more and less, or useful, not useful, uh, or kind, uh, quite of per personal distinction. Should I travel to London or to Oslo, uh, and if I cannot be at the same place at the same time, at both places, so I have to make a decision and oscillate between two possibilities. So uh, the, this all depends on a idea of the observer who is uh, the last reference uh, in choosing uh, or reactualizing his memory and choosing a distinction for future oscillation, which includes uh, distinguishing the distinction, whether we are political, interested in having power and having an office uh, to spend power, so to speak, uh, or whether we are scientists and think in terms of theories and, and, and demonstration of truth and so on and so forth, or whether we are family, uh, uh, have an interest in maintaining our family uh, and uh, organizing everything around uh, family life, neighbors and, and tastes. And, uh, and solve a solution of internal problems and so on and so forth. This, uh, <coughs> that's the last point, um, can be uh, seen as a question to, w as the question what is reality in this kind of thinking. If you have no contact to the environment, if you cannot reach the outside with your own operations, if you cannot think out of your brain or your consciousness, and if you cannot communicate with, say, uh, th chemicals to say, wow, change, please, uh, uh, your poisonous effects and your pollution, uh, you cannot say it to the chemicals and then hope that they will either obey or not obey. They will not even understand. So the, uh, if we have this kind of, of operational closure, we must internalize the reality uh, aspect in the sense that what is then reality? Traditionally, of course, reality is always, uh, since at least since Kant, a, a, a test, a result of a test uh, using the resistance of the outside, the Ding an sich, uh, as a uh, resisting force. If it doesn't go, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And then we know not the reasons, and we have to construct our own ideas about why it doesn't work. But that it doesn't work is, is uh, an, an impact of the environment on the system. But if we cannot uh, check uh, whether it works or not, because we have only internal operations, what is then the, uh, the uh, reality? What, what is meant by reality in this kind of theory? And I think we should uh, not uh, give up the idea of resistance, but we should replace or place it into the system and say that it is the result of or the solution of an internal conflict, uh, and it is the result of 
a resistance of operations of the system against operations of the same system. So there is a resistance of communication against communication. If I present a theory and everybody shakes his head, then no, that's unacceptable. And, and uh, I find always in the communication resistance, then uh, it is a kind of, of reality test uh, within the system without any regard to, to outside uh, questions, purely on the level of communication. And this, of course, has to do with the theory of memory, which I tried to, to, to outline uh, just before. So memory is the, the possibility of resist, uh, uh, resistance against uh, new ideas, new irritations, new impulses, new, uh, uh, new uh, problems. We have always to, to check whether it works within our memory frame. There is no other check. This is, uh, by the way, this again uh, uh, a Paul de Man formula, resistance of language against language uh, as a kind of, and this refers again to postmodern literature. But the, the background is completely different. Now a final remark, uh, <coughs> if we as sociologists offer such complicated and, and to large extent unplausible or, or uh, difficult to conceive uh, idea about society, <coughs> about the world, about systems in general, then uh, could we contribute to the self-description of modern society? Uh, could, we, uh, could we expect as sociologists to influence the way people think uh, about society, about the world, about modernity, and so on and so forth? Or is this uh, because the, the theory is so abstract, so, so complicated, uh, so, so unusual to accept, uh, so contradicting everything we take for granted in everyday life, so that there are other people outside? And, and so, uh, or could we uh, not have this kind of idea? And I'm rather skeptical from many uh, kind of discussions and uh, also from the relatively isolation of, of this kind of self-referential system theory in the inter already in the intellectual discourse of, of uh, the last decades uh, and the difficulties to, to explain this. Uh, I'm rather skeptical whether we could compete with uh, what mass media normally present as the world, the society, with preference to, to moral integration, to moral values, to good and bad guys, and to, to action, uh, and uh, to persons, uh, uh, and to catastrophic events, and so on and so forth. Uh, and our, our normal, everyday awareness of the society and the modern world and the ecological problems, everything is so much uh, determined by the mass media that it would be difficult to compete uh, with the mass media. But this does not mean that, uh, that we are not able to write a better theory of modern society. Although if this is only for, for uh, sociological purposes, for improving uh, uh, theories in our special scientific field. And I think uh, if we can do this, this is already uh, a lot. Thank you very much. Professor Luhmann would be happy to take some, uh, some questions. We've, we've got some time. Nobody's coming in here now.
Excuse me, I have acoustic problems. I, that's too much noise around. Can you speak a bit louder? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think I have in mind two two different uh, authors which know each other, of course. Uh, that's one is uh, the the mathematical calculus of of Spencer Brown, uh, that uh, a student of Russell, uh, that uh, starts with uh, the injunction: make a distinction. Otherwise, you cannot indicate anything. You have to distinct distinguish what you indicate from everything else, at least from the unmarked uh, state of the world around it. Uh, and then the, uh, the idea of uh, re-entry leads to a, uh, it is a hidden paradox, because if a distinction re-enters itself, uh, it is on one side uh, the old distinction that re-enters itself, but uh, as a distinction which has re-entered itself, it is already a different one. So it is a, a paradox, and in some sense, I think the the solution of that's the part of the seminar this afternoon. Uh, the solution of a paradox is uh, for Spencer Brown the uh, the uh, the idea that you could not use traditional arithmetic or algebra to solve these kind of problems. You have to go in the in the field of secondary functions, in the field of imaginary spaces, imaginary numbers, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, and then you you cut the the uh, expectation that uh, numbers refer to realities which can be counted, and uh, you have uh, irrational uh, problems within the uh, within the uh, uh, mathematical calculation. And you cannot use the traditional forms anymore. And it goes not very far beyond this. Uh, unresolvable indeterminacy is uh, a formula in this context. It is also clear that it is not uh, unresolvable because it is outside of the system. It is a self-created uh, problem created by reentry. But uh, there is no clear indication how you can have a new calculus. And oscillation in the sense of Spencer Brown uh, is then simply a oscillation between marked and unmarked. If you uh, mark something, you can, by marking, not ignore the fact that there is unmarked space or unmarked state of the world around. And there are some comments on it that uh, uh, all observations severs the world into two parts, and the unity is no longer visible. But there is no and, uh, irresolvable, unresolvable indeterminacy means that, uh, that there is no uh, calculus available within the traditional things. And the other uh, reference is Heinz von Förster. Uh, he has a collection of essays in, in English observing systems. Uh, and the latest one are not in this collection. This is from 81. Uh, but he makes a distinction between trivial and non-trivial machines. Trivial machines are machines which, which uh, produce, uh, if you give the same input and the same uh, transformation function works, you have the same output. And if uh, it doesn't come out, then the machine needs repair. Uh, uh, there's something wrong with the machine. Uh, so if you say, ah, the machine makes clack, 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 and then it comes one. And if you say B, clack, 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 and two. And if you say again A, uh, then uh, it comes again one. Uh, and uh, in the non-trivial machines, this is no longer, these are self-referential machines which use their own output as input without distortion by environmental effects, without something new. Uh, and the, that's a Turing machine in a sense. Uh, and these machines are unreliable 
because, for example, if you get a question uh, from your teacher and you give the answer, it may be right or, or wrong, uh, but then if the question is r repeated, then you ask, why does, does he ask the same question once more? Uh, and then you say, well, you ask, you give not the answer, but you ask, what does it mean to ask always the same questions? So you have a new state of mind produced by repetition, and you become unreliable. And the idea for education is interesting. Hanson Furster says that uh, we, our education system uh, tries to educate trivial machines, giving uh, always the correct answer to questions. But we should, uh, we should educate unreliable people, <laughs> which, uh, which have always the idea they could invent something new uh, if uh, the, the context is boring or if, if you have no ideas, why not uh, change your mind? And then, of course, on this level of non-trivial machines, uh, an unreliability of, of their, their, uh, their operational modalities, uh, then you have uh, the question of what, how to have an idea of education, how to have a kind of decision-making uh, theory. One of the ideas is that decision-making is, uh, you need decisions only uh, in the case of undecidable issues. Otherwise, uh, it is clear, the matter is clear. And, and how to uh, cope constantly with undecidable issues by decisions. Uh, so these are the, <coughs> on the, and the reason is, of course, mathematically uh, stated. If you have a, a re-entry or a, a output as input of the system, the system explodes in possibilities. <laughs> and uh, I don't know the, the exact uh, form of calculation, but he uh, had some first uh, if you have four inputs and four outputs, and uh, if you introduce the outputs as inputs, you have an astronomical uh, number of possibilities, and nobody will, not the system as it's such, and not the, uh, no outside observer can, can know what it is, uh, uh, what it will do. And we have this, I, I think, uh, also in romantic literature. In Jean Paul, for example, he says, you cannot make a prognosis of your own will. It's, will is unprognosticable. I cannot say, I cannot fix my will for tomorrow. There are three more questions waiting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One there. Well, uh, this is partly a, a reformulation or redescription of, a, of the classical uh, ideas of uh, sociology of knowledge. That a semantic state means ideas or concepts or words uh, which are in a certain use and uh, change their use. And a social structure uh, refers to social conditions. And the point, uh, the distinction between this kind of uh, sociology of knowledge and the, the classical one, Marx, uh, Mannheim, and so, also the Edinburgh Science uh, Unit, uh, that on the other side is not simply interest or power, but the forms of differentiation. So I try within these, uh, these are essays, more or less long essays, uh, on historical matters like uh, concept of time, like uh, love, uh, ideas about passionate love, and so on and so forth, S reason of state. And the idea is that the, the uh, uh, semantics changes on almost, almost all concepts are changed during the 17th and 18th century as a response to a new form of differentiation, to a transition from stratificatory differentiation to functional differentiation. And this has to do with a work in Bielefeld of historians like Kozelek, who say that the late 18th century, the last third of the 18th century, centering around French Revolution, did change all, all social and political concepts in Europe. 
uh, and I, but this is just an historical observation description, but not no explanation why this is so. And I try to to say that if we have a radical change in the dominant pattern of internal differentiation of the society, then even of course interest change, power uh, change, the concept of interest is invented in this kind of uh, of a transition, uh, or it gets a new meaning. So the, the real uh, uh, other side of the distinction is not interest, but uh, social differentiation. Well, there are two possibilities to answer this. The first is whether this is uh, already not on the level of the more recent uh, theories of self-referential systems, and whether we have simply the necessity to simplify, or whether there is within system theory uh, development in the, uh, in the direction of second order thinking of uh, inbuilt self-reference into systems and and so uh, this is one uh, uh, question, or one type of answer. And I'm, I think that uh, we should reformulate uh, the, uh, the uh, separate beer type of cybernetics uh, in these more recent uh, terms. But then the question, in my experience, is that there is indeed a possibility, especially in the, in the uh, business consultant uh, work to, to use uh, autopoetic uh, ideas and to use uh, the Palo Alto type of constructivism and family therapy. Uh, so <coughs> there is no, uh, the consultant doesn't know the reality uh, and he has to use certain tests uh, or certain prescriptions uh, to see whether this has a diagnostic value, if the prescription doesn't work, he is a little bit more informed about reality than, uh, and otherwise it would be work and then things are okay. And the background assumptions uh, are indeed uh, on the level of uh, this kind of second order cybernetics, this kind of constructivist epistemology. Uh, and they are well, uh, I have regular meetings with people from uh, family therapy and, and business consultants, uh, and they try to, to work uh, with this kind of a thinking. But then the interesting point is that they cannot communicate their background ideas. They cannot s uh, convince uh, a normal enterprise that it is an autopoetic system. <laughs> So they, they, need, uh, they need the theory to generate ideas, and, but uh, the, the language level is different uh, within the group, within the team, within the internal educational mechanism of family therapists or uh, business consultants, which mix more no very much nowadays. Uh, and, uh, but in fact, it is, uh, it is influential on this, on this field. But if I think uh, of politics, uh, I was uh, in, I must, I must say, in former parts of my life, I was a member of com government committees and so on. There, was, there were formidable la language restrictions to use <laughs> this kind of committee work. And uh, so it is, uh, I'm rather, there are certain slots, certain possibilities of access on a more immediate therapeutic or, or, or consultant work. But uh, I doubt whether this, uh, this uh, will influence the, uh, 
the uh, idea the public or uh, normal people have about uh, modern conditions of life. Up on the balcony. Thank you. Um, Well, I would not deny the possibility. I would rather say this is a kind of random problem. <coughs> maybe something is successful, maybe some ideas. Uh, I found politicians in Germany using the term Contingenzbewältigung, contingency management, uh, <laughs> without, without knowing what contingency means and what results are, can be expected from management. Of contingency, <laughs> but uh, so on the rhetoric level, there is a certain uh, influence, <coughs> and uh, I think also that uh, uh, that there are some uh, uh, roots which are more uh, probable uh, than others. My experience now is, uh, for example, in the the discussions about ethics. Uh, it is, uh, it is, I'm invited every year to three, three, four, five conferences about ethics, about ecological ethics, about banking ethics, about whatever kind of ethics. And I don't see the ethics. I mean, uh, I, I see the attempt to formulate rules, but this is a kind of paralegal <laughs> thing, but, but it has nothing to do with Kant, not with Bantam, not with any kind of academic ethical tradition. And normally, I, uh, I use, the, in these discussions, the, the distinction good-bad or good-evil. And, uh, and then say, well, uh, is the distinction good or bad? Uh, and uh, you could say, well, the dis uh, ethics is good. Why it is bad? It is good, of course. The dis to make a distinction between good and bad is good. But then, uh, are you responsible for the consequences if they are in ethnic or religious disputes? Uh, and I propose normally that it's bad to make a distinction uh, between good and bad. Like uh, the, uh, in the paradise, it was forbidden, I mean, to make this distinction. Uh, and uh, now it is of, uh, to use moral terms, is of uh, the highest degree of immorality. Uh, and so you took just to take the distinction from the other side. And then it is where uh, they think that's uh, either a, a kind of devilish uh, <laughs> trick to, to, uh, to avoid ethical constraints on behavior or whatever. And uh, I was even asked in a, in a theological setting in Mexico whether I have close contact with the devil. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, I, I, I say, no, no context? No, I am. <laughs> but <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, if, if you have fashionable things like culture, ethics, uh, and so it is hard to get on a on a level of reflection which uses this kind of observer observational theory. So, um, I think it's uh, it is uh, we need a mixed answer to your question, and and we could not uh, the prognosis is very difficult. The political consultancy in, in my life was very disappointing, uh, partly because I didn't care for, for party support, uh, and uh, you could not do anything without a good party support, in, in, in Germany at least. Uh, and 
So, and the, the understanding with political friends was that I should refrain from going into committees and rather try to develop my own theory and, uh, and not be spending every Friday in Bonn. Well, uh, on the level of, uh, in the biological field, uh, I'm of course not uh, competent to answer this question, but my impression is that the theory of autopoiesis simply ignores the question of the beginning. Uh, partly because uh, uh, the question is when a system really becomes autopoietic uh, and what was the previous state, uh, has no, the previous state has no explanatory uh, function for the, for the understanding of, uh, for example, when DNA uh, came uh, into, into use in, in the living mechanism. This doesn't uh, explain much of the biological structures because this is then a question of evolution. It sets a, a kind of evolutionary possibility free uh, and uh, free under the only constraint that it should not, not prevent autopoiesis. And the, the whole distinction of, of uh, living forms is, uh, is not, does not depend on the, on the beginning. It is not a kind of, of original state which explains the later things. But in, uh, my interest is more to transfer this to social systems and to say, well, communication is is autopoetic in the sense that you can only communicate not as a single act without previous and later uh, act, but just uh, referring to previous communication. And then you have, uh, of course, the question when, for example, a function system becomes autopoetic. Uh, for example, when the legal system actually uh, becomes autopoetic uh, in the sense that it creates its own premises. Uh, and uh, uh, and then my idea would be that it needs a kind of evolutionary advance or a kind of, of preparedness of society so that uh, the legal system can interpret if it's begin to work on an autopoetic sense, it can use previous uh, habits, customs as law, uh, which they were not, as, as law separate from religion, for example, uh, or uh, and uh, the same is true with the monetary economy. When, uh, when uh, people did invent coin money, it was not uh, in the sixth uh, century before Christ, it, is, it was not invented as an exchange mechanism, but as soon as it became adapted to an ex as an exchange mechanism, then of course the, the possibilities of economic exchange explored, and uh, then you could interpret the the old credit mechanism in merchant houses and so as economic. Uh, but before it was simply household. Uh, and so the, uh, there's an, a redescription of history uh, within the autopoetic system to adapt history of previous states to, uh, to the assumption that the system was always autopoetic. Yeah, I think that's, uh, it is partly helpful to, to uh, avoid the assumption that some states of society are naturally good. 
we could uh, we could avoid the idea that market society is superior as well just uh, as market society and see uh, the problems we have for example with international financial systems uh, and to uh, to uh, suggest a uh, responsibility for decision making for choosing structures which goes beyond uh, uh, the idea that there are good principles and bad principles planning is bad and and so and uh, <coughs> I had an interesting discussion with the uh, Chinese uh, he was in the embassy in, in, in Bonn and is now a uh, was then minister, I don't know, in, in China, about economic development. And so uh, he wanted to make, a, uh, he accepted a dissertation on the autonomy of science and did even finance it from China. And uh, then I, the, the discussion was as follows, uh, why did you do this? Why did you think of science as a system? Well, he said, we would c uh, multiply the gross national product with four, until the year 2000, and we are clear that uh, that this needs a, uh, a scientific base. So we want four or five years to make science and then apply it to the economy. And then my question was uh, how large the percentage of, of uh, application he thinks of science, and his answer was 100%, of course. And I said, well, we, we are used to think in terms of 15 or 18 or 20% uh, usable scientific results and well that's capitalistic waste we don't do this we have to learn <laughs> and then uh, my qu further question was how could you make a distinction between economic rational and economic irrational uh, application of science and without uh, mobile prices without changeable prices without market conditions and then the the discussion went another way but <laughs> but uh, so what kind of questions we have to ask uh, this would be uh, make a difference. Not so much what kind of solution we can propose, but what is the problem? What is the the uh, problem? And in the in the East Germany, I think one of the problems is the the habit to expect everything from organization, from state, from uh, and uh, the uh, the lack of awareness of the necessity of risk in your own life, and uh, so. But there is no, uh, I think, no one answer for, to this question. But uh, confronted with uh, with daily problems in these countries, I think it's always uh, you have other ideas and 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 the most part, uh, mostly other problems. I think three more only. Uh, first one now. On resistance. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Well, this depends very much on what kind of system you have in mind. If I take uh, the brain, for example, or the, uh, the centralized nervous system, nerve system, neuro system, uh, then I think the... Uh, Resistance is uh, just in the in the habits of linking uh, linking mechanisms uh, and and a kind of conflict solution. For example, you have you c have a confused uh, way. If you have two eyes, you have a confused picture. In the in the you have a conflict, and what you see is the resolution of the conflict, not something which is imported from the outside. But you create an, an indeterminate situation via different ways to look at the reality, and you solve it uh, with space distinction. Or in memory, if you have, uh, if we we would have no time idea yesterday and today and so on and so forth, we would have everything at the same time. That means uh, unresolvable conflicts. But if you have time, you can say, well, this was yesterday. I was on the airport yesterday, and now I'm here. So uh, uh, it is not a confusion. We can solve uh, by temporal distinctions many of the problems. And then time becomes uh, 
a real a, a indicator of reality. And I think we could use the same, uh, the same idea in communication uh, in the sense that you, <coughs> you f have resistance. If you have crazy ideas, you don't find uh, acceptance in your public and you, you eliminate uh, things and you, uh, you do not, uh, uh, you can use innovation. But innovation is always pre-tested, what could be accepted and what not. Uh, and uh, so the communication, always the, the possibilities of a yes and a no as an answer. You can reject or accept what uh, is proposed. And this is a kind of, of uh, resistance. Uh, and you, you check always uh, whether you find resistance or not. Uh, of course, you can. You can like to have resistance, you can like conflict, and you can provoke uh, and uh, have a kind of remote control. You provoke the public, and you know it would explode at least, uh, and, uh, and you enjoy it. Uh, but uh, it is always a kind of checking uh, the possibility of resistance uh, in, in uh, premeditating communication. Well, generally, I have the tendency, tendency to say uh, to operate on the level of problems and to change the conception of problems and to leave the decision to the system. So, uh, uh, and to use decisions as a uh, in the system, not as I propose to the system, as a kind of testing of future and to increase the awareness of, of decisions as a condition of prognostic activities in the system. If you don't decide anything, you have no possibilities of prognostic uh, view of the future. If you do not fix a commitment, you could not uh, say what would happen and what would not happen, and you could not correct uh, your prognosis. So I tend to, uh, in activities uh, of this type of of consultant discussions or whatever, to, to work on the level of problems to see, do you have the right problem? Uh, or do you have the answer, but what was the problem? Uh, and, uh, and then to have a kind of functional uh, analysis to say, well, if this is a problem, you have a limited but uh, a kind of, of uh, functional equivalent solutions and uh, try one and see what happens and beware or remember that you made a decision and you can have a kind of post decision or regret and try to 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 revise the decision but uh, i'm very reluctant uh, uh, or only if there are very crude mistakes where they didn't know, know whether they didn't need any kind of consultant uh, work but in very crude case of con we can say this is simply wrong and please revise your decision.
Well, yes, I think um, actually I'm working on a, on a book on which will be published probably in Italy first uh, on organization and decision. And, uh, and the idea is that the autopoietic mechanism is decision uh, in the sense that every premises of operations within a system has to be introduced in the form of decisions, membership is a result of decision. Who is member, who is not member, what kind of obligations, uh, what kind of, uh, of acceptance, or what kind of indifference uh, is presupposed by membership. And of course, programs are decisions. And of course, uh, structures, hierarchies, are results of decisions. So everything is based on a decision. Uh, and then you get habits and so-called <coughs> organizational culture and so, but you can dissolve this again uh, uh, in, uh, in decisions by saying that organizational culture or corporate culture is a, a, a result of decisions which has become undecidable. Uh, you forget simply that it was a decision or an, an, an aggregate of many decisions. Uh, and so reproduction of decision by decision making is the the term of an autopoietic uh, theory of organization, which needs a careful work on the, uh, on the, on the concept of choice and decision. Uh, so I'm just reading uh, Shackle, the British economist, uh, uh, in terms of what is choice and uh, how did uh, decision or choice produce something new, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, I think if you... Uh, uh, use this kind of, of uh, theory, you have, to, uh, you have not to be content to define decision as choice. But you have to explain uh, how the elements of choice are distinguished in the first place. Well, the, uh, there is a, uh, a German version. Actually, it was a series of lectures at the University of Lecce, and uh, they become translated into Italy. And we, I go to Italy in the May and in October to, to make it, uh, to revise the translation and to, uh, and then the German manuscript is it needs o only cosmetic uh, uh, work and uh, and the souterrain of, of footnotes needs improvement and. Uh, and so, but uh, the ideas are ready, and and I try to find a publisher. That's always a problem, to, uh, which almost simultaneously uh, published in German and English. Uh, this is De Gruyter in, in Berlin, but uh, uh, so far there is some work to do. Well, uh, very very reluctantly, I think we must we must stop there. Um, but Professor Luhmann has given us a rich, suggestive lecture, uh, which is um, going to be for us a memorable event uh, in our centenary year. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you.